I want to ask you kind of a personal question this morning and just for you to think about for a moment. How would you say that your relationship with God is going? Where would you say you are in your relationship with God? How deep is your trust in God? Do you trust Him? No matter what happens, do you trust Him? There's so many things that happen in our life that, you know, sometimes would bring about fear in the life of a lot of us and maybe most people. Perhaps some things have happened in our lives that have caused us maybe to have some doubts to arise in our hearts. So that's why I ask you, how is your relationship with God? How deep is your trust, no matter what happens, that you don't allow fear, that you don't allow doubts to come into your hearts. This year we're talking about being stronger than ever. And every month has got a different, uh, different focus for us and the focus for the month of, uh, of November is being stronger than ever in my relationship with God. My relationship with my God. How strong is that relationship? And as I thought about the doubts that sometimes arise in our hearts, as I thought about Peter, the great faith that Peter exhibited when he got out of the boat and he walked on water. You see anybody else getting out of the boat and walking on water? Peter had an amazing faith to get out and to walk on water. But we don't think about Peter walking on the water. What do we think about Peter doing? We think about him sinking. Why? Jesus said it, said it to him. Where's your faith? Why do you doubt? If Peter, right there in the face of Jesus, could allow doubts to arise in his hearts, do doubts sometimes arise in our hearts? And as I thought this past week about trying to see what does the Bible teach us about how to deal with doubts and fears that may arise in our hearts and how can we address those in our lives. And as I started to try to make a list of some things that the Bible teaches it was amazing how often I was coming back to find verses in Psalm 27. And so instead of going to various places in the Bible this morning to see what various passages in the Bible teach about how to deal with doubts and fears and to strengthen our relationship with God this morning, I just want us to turn to Psalm 27. And we're not going to go anywhere else this morning in the Bible, so I, I would urge you to get your Bible out to get the pew Bible out and just open it up and to park it right there in Psalm 27. And I just want us to have a Bible study this morning and to allow Psalm 27 to help us to see how we can learn to wait on the Lord. You look at the last verse in verse 14 and it says it twice there. How we as Christians, how we as followers of God can learn to wait on on the Lord with confidence. Not to allow these doubts and fears to overcome us, but to wait on the Lord, to trust in the Lord, no matter what's happened in our lives. Do we need that? You know, sometimes the devil gets going and the devil gets after us, and sometimes we allow thoughts to come into our hearts that we, didn't, we never thought we would have those thoughts about God. And yet, sometimes it happens. I want us to allow Psalm 27 to teach us this morning to teach us some things that we need to have in our hearts about waiting on God and allowing God to be God instead of me trying to be God and to wait on the Lord and to do that with confidence. The first thing I want us to recognize this morning as we examine some things in Psalm 27 is that we are faced today with the unfortunate reality that all followers of God face. And it's a reality that David faced. This psalm, if you've got it at the beginning of the psalm, this psalm is attributed, believed to have been written by David. Did David face some unfortunate realities in his life? Did he face some unfortunate circumstances in his life? He details some of those in Psalm 27. I want you to see if you can relate to David. I want you to see in Psalm 27 if you can relate to David when in verse 5 he says, I am living in the time of trouble. Anybody feel like that? Now don't look around and don't nudge somebody in your family and say he's talking about you today. That's not the idea. But do we live in the time of trouble today? Have you turned on the news lately? Have you checked your news app? Like we live in a time of trouble and David says, 
I live in a time of trouble. Can you believe? That's 3,000 years ago. He lived in trouble. We live in trouble. Look at what's happening with David. Look in verse 2 where David talks about there being the wicked, or your Bible might say the evildoers who came up or assailed against me. Four times in this psalm he's going to use that expression, against me. Do you ever feel like people are working against you? You think the world is working against you? David says there's evildoers, there's wicked that is working against me. Later in verse 2 he talks about those foes and those adversaries who are opposing him. And he says, you know what? It even feels like in verse 3, there is an army that has encamped against me. You ever feel like that? You ever feel like everything is against you? Not just one or two things that are, but do you ever feel like there's just an army of things out there that's just, things are just not going my way. David says, you know what? Even if there is an army that is working against me. Even later on in verse 3, he talks about, even if there is a war that is raging against me. Does the Bible tell us as Christians that we are engaged in warfare? You ever read that in the New Testament? You ever read about Paul saying, I have fought the good fight? Well, what's that all about? That's about the warfare that we are involved in. How often does Paul call himself a soldier of Christ? How often does the Bible talk about, like in Ephesians chapter 6, put on the whole armor of God? Well, what do you need that for? Because as followers of God, we're engaged in a warfare. And David says, yep, 3,000 years ago, I'm engaged in a warfare where there's enemies who are against me. See that expression again. Look down in verse 6 again where he talks about his enemies being all around him. You go down to verse 11 and he talks about how his enemies are there and trying to stand in his way and obstruct his path. You get down into verse 12 and he talks about how those adversaries, he says they have a will, they have a desire. What is that to harm him? You get down into verse 12 and he talks about those false witnesses. Again, that expression against me four times here. He talks about those false witnesses that are arising against me. False witnesses that are coming up and trying to slander me. Say th- they're false, wit- they're liars. And they're saying things about me that are not true. Has anybody ever done that about you? Anybody ever lied about you? Said something about you that was not true and it caused you all sorts of heartache? Can you relate to David at all? Do any of these ring true? Do we see ourselves living in a time of trouble? Do we feel like things are against us, against us, against us, against us four times? That the world is out to get us? Does Psalm 27 fit us? Sometimes you read through the Psalms and you might think, you know, I'm not sure I can relate to some of those things. But I read through this Psalm and I can relate to a lot of this. What is sometimes our reaction to this kind of life. Do we question God? Do we doubt God? God, you know all of this is happening in my life. What's going on? Where are you, God? If you're truly a God who loves me, why are you not taking care of me? Why are you allowing my enemies to come out against me? You ever have those feelings? You ever have those thoughts? You ever have those doubts? come into your life? You ever think that the world is winning and you feel like maybe you're losing for some reason? That might be, for some people, the natural response to this kind of experience. But David tells us in Psalm 27, he tells us what the unnatural response is. If the natural response is to doubt God, if the natural response, like Peter walking on the what? He's got Jesus right in his face. And what does he do? Oh, no, I've got waves crashing around me. Do we ever do that? Do we ever take our eyes off the Lord and look at something that is insignificant in comparison to him? We allow those doubts to creep in. David says, although all of that's happening, Although I'm living in this time of trouble and everybody's out against me, David says, here's the unnatural response that I need to strive to have. Look in verse 1. He says, I don't care what's happening. Whom shall I fear? 
Whom shall I, what do you mean, whom shall I fear? We just listed all of these things in Psalm 27 of people that you ought to fear. And he says, whom shall I fear? Whom sh Later in verse 1, whom shall I be afraid? The natural response might be to be afraid, to be, to be fearful, to have doubts arise in, our heart, in his heart and says, that's not going to be me. Look down in verse 3. He says, my heart shall not fear. No matter what's happening around me, David says, in the face of persecution, in the face of all of these folks who are working against me, in the face of fear that some people might have, in the face of doubts that some people might have, look at what he says in verse 3. Verse 3, he says, Though an army may encamp against me. He says, I don't care. You make it the worst thing in the world. And the worst thing in the world, an army is encamping against me. My heart shall not fear. He says, though a war may rise against me. Go ahead. Let all of the nations of the earth come out against me. What could be worse than that? Though all of that happen. Look at what he says at the end of verse 3. In this. Your Bible might say, in spite of this. Or even in this. I will be confident. David says, I don't care how bad it gets. I don't care what's going on around me. I will be confident. Look down. That's what he's saying at the beginning of the psalm. Look down at the end of the psalm. You get down to the end of the psalm, look in verse 13. And the New King James, and, and various translations will do different things here. New King James puts this in italics. New King James says in verse 13, I would have lost heart. Think about it, wouldn't you? If all of that's going on in our life, David says, I would have lost heart. I could have lost heart, but I didn't. Why? Because, verse 13 says, I believed. Your translation might say, I certainly believed. Or your translation might say, I remained steadfast. I remained confident in my Lord. Is that natural? Is that the natural response to calamity that comes in our lives? The natural response might be to question God. The, the natural response might be to doubt God. But the unnatural, the follower of God response is, I don't care what other people think. I don't care what other people say about me. I don't care what other people are doing around me. I don't care if they look down on me or think less of me, and I don't care if they're against me in a hundred million ways. I have confidence in my God. Do you have that kind of confidence? The heart of faith does not let fear overrule. And while we might not understand everything, here's what the heart of faith says. Maybe you've heard this before. Maybe you can finish it for me. Here's what the heart of faith says. Heart of faith looks at everything that's happening in the world. And the heart of faith says, if God be for us, who can, oh, you've heard that before, who can be against us? Think about that expression, who can be against us? Four times in Psalm 27, David's talking about all of these. They're against me, they're against me, they're against me, they're against me. And Paul says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 31, who cares who's against you if God is for you? David says, I'm confident. David says, I remain steadfast in my service to the Lord. Not in some cocky way, but in a confident way that my God is God. That my God is the ruler of the universe and He's my God, He's my Father, and I don't care what other people say. When you read Psalm 27, you read about this reality that we all face. You read about this unnatural response that we as followers of God need to make. Why should we have this kind of heart? Why should we have that kind of faith? Where does that kind of confidence come from in God? It comes from a realization of what David saw in Psalm 27 comes from a realization that there is the unimaginable refuge that followers of God have in God. 
Did David see all the bad stuff happening around him? Saw every bit of it. But look in verse 1. What does he say? He said, the Lord is my light. We live in a world of darkness. And there's darkness all around us. But David said, yeah, I'm in darkness, but I know where I'm going. The Lord is my light. You drop down later in the psalm and he explains how the Lord is his light down in verse 11 where he talks, he says to God, he says, Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a smooth path. How is the Lord his light? Well, maybe you know this verse. You heard this one before, right? The Bible says that thy word is a lamp. Oh, Eva's heard it. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. And a what? A light unto my path. When David says, the Lord is my light, where's that light coming from? Same place it's coming from for you. Do you have the Word of God? Here we are in the midst of darkness, and do we have confidence that we've got what is right because we've got the light given to us by God? I don't care what other people say. If God be for us, who can be against us? He's my light. But go back to verse 1. Lord is not only my light. Verse 1 says, the Lord is my salvation. Thank God for that. The world tries to drag me down. The devil tries to trip me up on every occasion and get me to sin. But the Lord is my salvation. He is the one, when you drop down to verse 7, He is the one who will hear me. He is the one when I've been trapped by the devil in sin who will hear me and have mercy on me and answer me and forgive me. Sometimes we let those doubts creep in. Sometimes we let those fears take over. And we need to be reminded, the Lord is my salvation. Look in verse 9. In verse 9, he calls him, I think it's the end of verse 9, where he calls him the God of my salvation. He's my salvation in verse 1. He's the God of my salvation in verse 9. And he's ready to forgive me even when I stumble and fall. You remember when Peter began to sink in the water? Remember how far away Jesus was from him when he began to sink? How far away was Jesus? In your imagination, was Jesus... A couple hundred yards away? Was he a couple, a dozen yards away? How close was Jesus when Peter began to sink? Peter began to sink and he prays the shortest prayer in all the Bible. Lord, save me. Have you ever prayed that prayer? You better learn that prayer. Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, save me. And the Bible says that Jesus had to get into a run because he was so far away from Peter. It says he had to get into a run to get over to Peter, and he was hoping he'd get there in time before Peter drowned. Is that what your Bible says? No. The Bible says he prayed the shortest prayer ever, Lord, save me. You know what the next word in your Bible is? In Matthew chapter 14, immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and saved him. Where was Jesus? Where was the God of his salvation when Peter needed him? Right there. Not in some distant place. David says, I don't care what's going on around me. The Lord's my light. The Lord is my salvation. Keep reading in verse 1. He is the strength of my day. Have you had a bad day before? Yesterday maybe? The day before? Have you had a bad day before? Was there anything good about it? Was there any strength in that day? David says, the Lord is the strength of my day. No matter what's happening around me, he recognized that the Lord is my stronghold. The Lord is the, is the steady one that I can hold on to. Look down in verse 5. He says, in the time of trouble, what am I going to do? In the time of trouble, God, my God, the stronghold, he shall hide me in his pavilion. He shall hide me in the secret place of his tabernacle. He shall set me upon a rock. I want you to think about that. No matter what's happening in my life, the promise of God is that he's going to hold on to me. He's going to take me and to hide me in the cleft of the rock. Psalm 46 talks about God is my refuge 
and strength. He's the one that I can run to. But one of my favorite parts of this psalm is back up in verse 2, where David is is talking about his enemies. Look in verse 2, where he says, The wicked, the evildoers came against me. Why did they come against me? To eat up and to devour my flesh. These people are out for blood. They're out to destroy me, my enemies and my foes. But look at what he says. My enemies and my foes come against me. They're out to devour me. And it is they who stumbled and fell. Not me. My enemies came. The world was against me. Everybody was down on me. And I should have been the one to stumble and fall, but I wasn't. It was they who stumbled. Why? Because my God took care of me. Because I live in a stronghold. I live in a refuge with God that cannot be penetrated by my enemies. And so when I hold myself in the hollow of God's hands and my enemies try to come at me, guess what's going to happen to them? They're going to fall because they can't get through my God's stronghold. I don't care what's going on around us. Do we have confidence in our God? Do we recognize the unimaginable refuge that we have that the Lord is my light, He's my salvation, He's my stronghold? You get down into verse 9, and David says, The Lord is my help. Four times he talks about God being my something. And he says in verse 9, The Lord is my help. Doesn't matter when, every time. Doesn't matter where, every place. The Lord is my help. Psalm 46 and verse 1, that first part of it says, God is our refuge and strength. The rest of verse 1 says, a very present help in time of trouble. What kind of help? Not just a present help. Our God is a very present help in time of trouble. And so look at what David says in this psalm. In verse 6, He said, my God lifted up my head above all of my enemies around me. I don't care what they're doing. My God picked me up and took care of me. Look over in verse 9. God did not hide His face from me. My God did not leave me. The end of verse 9. My God did not and would not leave me or forsake me. We just had our lectureship last weekend where where we talked about the promises of God. Is that not one of your favorite promises of God? That He will not leave you? nor forsake you. That's not just a New Testament promise. That's an Old Testament promise. That is a faithfulness of God promise that David says, even, verse 10, even when my mother and my father forsake me, even if those who are closest to me, even if they forsake me, I don't care. My God, He won't forsake me. What's He going to do? He won't forsake me because it is then, it is then when everybody else forsakes me that the Lord, the end of verse 10, will take care of me. I don't know where you've been, some of you. I don't know what you've been through. I don't know the people who have turned their backs on you that you thought might never turn their backs on you. But David says, even when those who are closest to me forsake me, it is then, do you see that at the end of verse 10? It's then that the Lord takes me in. And He takes me up, your translation might say. And He takes care of me. Do we recognize that unimaginable refuge that we have in God that He has promised to deliver us from those who would do us harm? David says in this psalm, there is that unfortunate reality where it seems like everybody is against us. But David says there's an unnatural response that followers of God ought to take, and that response is that I have confidence in my God Why should I have confidence in Him? Look at it. Why should I have utmost confidence in my God? Why, when all of this is happening, should I remain steadfast in my faith to Him? Because my God is steadfast towards me. He is my light. He is my salvation no matter what's happening in my life. He is there, my stronghold, who will hold on to me. And He's my help. Do you believe that? Not just a little bit. Not just you've read it in a book somewhere like the Bible. Not just you've heard some preacher talk about it. Do you believe it in the depths of your soul? That when you go out into the world and everybody is against you, you say, I don't care. Because if my God is for me, 
who can be against me? As we wrap up this lesson and look at the rest of what Psalm 27 says. The rest of Psalm 27 to me is, what do we do about what we've seen? What do we do when we recognize what the Lord is to us and what the Lord has done for us? What do I need to do? And I would encourage you and, and, and to read through the psalm and to see how often David says, I will do this and I will do this and I will do this. There's a number of things that David says that as a follower of God, that I've got to have the unwavering resolve, the unwavering resoluteness that says, I am going to take a stand and I am going to do this no matter what anybody else does. What am I going to do? I want you to see these very quickly. Look, look at Psalm 27 very quickly. What does David say? Look in verse 4 where David says, One thing I have desired of the Lord. If you, if you could think about this. David says, One thing I have desired of the Lord. How would you finish that statement? One thing I have desired of the Lord. Was it city slickers? Where the old guy said there's one, one thing, one thing, and then he died and... and uh, and Billy Crystal didn't figure out what that one thing was. One, David says, there's one thing. Sorry if you don't know what I'm talking about. It's a dumb movie. You shouldn't watch it. David says, there's one thing I've desired of the Lord. What is it, David? One thing I've desired of the Lord, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord. That I may be a part of his household. That, not, not just that I might be inside of a building, that's a part of it. But that I might be a part of of who He is and a part of His family, that I might have sweet communion with the God of heaven. Not just that I come and sing a couple songs and, and partake of the Lord's Supper on a Sunday and okay, that's my communion with the Lord. That's not what David's talking about. He says, one thing I have desired of the Lord that I may dwell in His house all the days of my life, not just on Sunday. That I might be in His presence. That I might behold His beauty. That I might gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. Not talking about just about creation. It's talking about the amazing loving kindness of God. And David says, God has been so loving and kind and gracious to me. And he says, I just want to meditate on that. I just want to think about that and what He's done for me. That I might be in His house and His place and just inquire of Him. Your Bible might say instead of the word inquire there in verse 4, that I might meditate there. David wanted to worship God. The world around him was falling apart and, and, and going against him. And what did he want to do? Worship his God. What do you want to do? Is, is, is worship, and, and when we come together on Sunday, is worship just, well, that's just something as a Christian. That's, that's what you ought to do. You ought to go to church. At least every once in a while, you ought to go to church. Or is this our refuge? Is this where we gather not because we have to, but because we long to? One thing I've desired of the Lord, that I can take my focus of off, off of everything that's against me and put my focus on the Lord and to gaze upon and meditate upon the greatness of my God. That's why we worship God. It's to meditate on His greatness and to extol and praise His greatness. David says, you get down to verse 6. David says, I will offer sacrifices with shouts of joy. I, I am going to not just bemoan the fact that I've got to worship God. I'm not just going to begrudge the fact that I need to make sacrifices to God. I'm going to shout with joy. Do we do that? When we worship God, you say, oh, 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 man, that was a long sermon. Wow, you know, I didn't really know those songs. Oh, I, I, the song leader's not doing what... I, why, do, do we bemoan in worship or do we shout for joy that we get to worship our God? What a privilege it is that we get to be in His presence to tell our God how awesome He is, to lean on His mighty arm, recognizing we're not going to make it through this life without Him. The end of verse 6, he says, I will sing praises. Yes, I love the word yes at the end of verse 6. I will sing, I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. I'm going to sing and make melody to the Lord. Verse 7, he says, I'm going to cry with my voice to my God. I'm going to pray to God. I'm going to talk to my Father. My prayers are going to be addressed to my Father because that's how prayers are to be addressed. But he says, I'm going to cry out to my God and, and, and tell Him what's on my heart. Verse 8, When you said, God, seek my face, 
Guess what my heart said? When you said, seek my face, my heart said, your face, Lord, I will seek. That's what I want to do. Not because I have to. Because I want to obey you. I want to seek your face. And what that means is, I want to be in your presence and I want your approval. I don't want to do things to meet my approval. I want to do things to meet your approval. I will trust in the providence of God. When David says in verse 9, do not hide your face from me. When he says, do not turn away from me. When he says, do not leave me or forsake me. He recognized the providence of God would always be there for him. David said, I will listen to him. Teach me your way. Lead me in a smooth path. David says, I will listen to him and walk in his way. I will follow his path. Is that our heart? Is our heart when we come to the Bible to follow the Lord in the paths that we like? that are pleasing to us, but in the path that He would have us to go, that, well, that's a little harder, Lord. I'm not really sure I like that path. So, uh, it, is, is Christianity, is the Bible, is it like a buffet line where you just take and pick from what you want and leave what's rest? David says, Lord, teach me Your way. Show me in the light of Your Word the path laid out in front of me as plain as can be so that I can follow it. Is that our heart? Do we seek to follow after the Lord wherever He leads us? You get down into verse 11, or verse 13, where He says, Again, I believe that I will see the goodness of the Lord in this life. He says, See the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Not that I just have to get to heaven to see the goodness of the Lord. I know that I'm going to see the goodness of the Lord today. Verse 14. In verse 14, He starts talking to Himself. He's been talking to God throughout this psalm. But in verse 14, he starts talking to himself. He says, wait, David, on the Lord. Wait for the Lord. Trust the Lord in His timing. Do we do that? Trust the Lord in His ways. Sometimes we want the Lord to do it our way and on our clock. Sometimes we need to say to ourselves, wait. Wait for the Lord. Let the Lord take care of this in His time and in His way and be courageous to know that while the world may be crashing down around me and while everything may be against me, I'm not going to find my courage anywhere else but in my God. Talking this month, emphasizing this month about being stronger than ever, my relationship with my God. And as I asked you at the beginning this morning, how is your relationship with your God? How much do you trust Him? How deep is that trust that you have in your God? When those fears and doubts sometimes start to arise in your hearts, what do you do to get rid of them? Here's, I don't know how many things are on the screen right now, maybe a dozen. Here's a dozen things that David said, here's what I'm going to do. I will not fear, verse 3. And instead of fearing, here's what I will do instead. I will take these steps to put my faith and my trust in the Lord so that I am unwavering in my resolve to serve Him. May God help us. May God help us not to just say that we believe in God. Not just say, yeah, I I believe what the Bible says. But to get into it to build a trusting, loving, faithful relationship with our God that no matter what is against us, we know that when we are faithfully following the Lord that He is for us and that's all that matters. Are you a Christian this morning? Have you followed the path that the Bible lays out, the New Testament lays out that leads unto eternal life? You know, David said, Lord, teach me your way and show me the path. You get to the New Testament, there were individuals in the New Testament that says, what must I do to be saved? And God says, here's the path. You want the path to eternal life? Here it is. You read throughout the New Testament and individuals were told they needed to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. That He came and lived a sinless life, died on the cross, not because of any sins He committed, but because of every sin that I've committed. He was buried in that tomb, and on the third day, He was raised from the dead. Do you believe that? 
you believe the evidence that is there that proves that, then that evidence, that faith ought to cause you to repent, to turn away from the sin that put Jesus on the cross. Say, I don't want to do that anymore. I want to stop doing what's wrong. I want to start doing what's right. And if you're ready to make that decision today, you can do what they did in the New Testament and confess the faith that is in your heart. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And this very day, you can do what they did in New Testament times and be baptized. Why should you be baptized? Because Acts 2 and verse 38 says, that's the only way to be saved from your sins. That's the only way, verse 41 and verse 47 says, to be added to the Lord's family, to His church. And being in His family and in His church, Hebrews 12 verse 23 says, is the only way to have your name enrolled in heaven. That's why you should be baptized, and that's why you should do it today. To arise and be baptized and have every one of your sins washed away today to live a faithful life of confidence in our God. Confident that if God is for me, it doesn't matter who's against me. Confident that I am going to put Him first for the rest of my life, walking in the light as He is in the light. If you're not a faithful Christian this morning, if you need to get your life right with the Lord this day, we encourage you to come right now as together we stand and sing.